Okay, so hello everyone and uh, welcome to the first ICTS string seminar of this season. Uh, so today we are very happy to have uh, Eran Palti telling us about convexity of charge operators in CFTs and the weak gravity conjecture. So Eran, please take it away. Okay, hello everybody. Um, so let me first of all thank the organizers for the uh, invitation to speak. It's a great pleasure uh, and an honor. Um, so indeed, I will talk about convexity of charged operators in CFTs and the weak gravity conjecture. And this uh, talk will be based on work that um, came out about uh, a month ago with um, Ofer Aharoni. Um, okay, so let me begin with some introduction. Uh, so uh, string theory provides a large number of different uh, low energy effective theories, which have an ultraviolet completion to quantum gravity. And in general, these different effective theories have different properties, like different number of particles, different gauge groups, and so on. But there are some rare features, which as far as we can tell, are common to all of them. So they do seem to have some universal features as far as we can tell. Um, and the Swanblan program is motivated by the existence of such apparently universal features with the aim to understand if they are always required by any theory which has a UV completion to quantum gravity. Um, so they are somehow some sort of consistency conditions to do with quantum gravity. And perhaps one of the oldest uh, such idea is, is, is that there is no, uh, that in quantum gravity, there are no U1 global symmetries. So that's uh, an old such uh, proposal. And uh, the simplest argument for this is that um, if you think about a theory, a gravitational theory with a U1 uh, global symmetry, then uh, you can consider forming a black hole. And uh, the black hole, uh, um, because of the no hair theorem, will not reflect any of that global symmetry on its horizon. So, um, uh, since it doesn't reflect its global symmetry charge on its horizon, there is in some sense an infinite uncertainty um, if you look at such a black hole as to what its microstates are. So there's a, an infinite number of microstates associated to a black hole with fixed mass. It could have any charge. And this is in contradiction with the expected finite entropy of black holes from Bekenstein Hawking. So this is in some ways the simplest, I think, way to try and um, understand what is no U1 global symmetries in, in quantum gravity. Uh, so I should say, please feel free to interrupt with any questions. If you have any. And it's possible to kind of rephrase this uh, argument um, uh, in terms of an infinite number of so-called black hole remnants. Um, it's essentially the same kind of, uh, um, it's, it's basically the same thing, except uh, now you consider black holes of a fixed mass around the Planck scale. So the story is just like this. You can form a black hole from, by throwing in n copies of, of, of a particle charged under the global symmetry, and then you form a charge N object. And now you let this black hole um, uh, uh, Hawking uh, lose its, shed its mass through Hawking radiation. And this Hawking radiation will not emit any global symmetry charge because there is no global symmetry charge reflected on the horizon. So it cannot distinguish even between positive and negative charge, for example. And then at the end, the black hole will go down to, well, until at least, at least it leaves the semi-classical regime where we don't really know what happens. But by then it's going to have some kind of Planck scale mass and it's not going to be able to shed its charge back because um, uh, it's lost all its mass but kept all its charge. So what you get is a remnant. That's what's called a remnant. It's an object that's uh, stable due to its charge. And this will be some object that's stable of charge N. And of course, you can do the same thing with any number of particles that you throw in. So you get um, this way an infinite number of completely stable um, objects in your theory, completely stable remnants. And this infinite number of remnants is essentially matched to the infinite number of microstates that a black hole of fixed mass would have. Um, it's basically uh, the same thing. Um, so this is, uh, in some sense, just a slight rephrasing of that. And, and that's, of course, we know is in contradiction with Bekenstein Hawking entropy. And then you can rephrase this again. So this is kind of rephrasing it in ways that um, will uh, motivate what we want to say in the talk. This, this time it's not a complete, it's not really an exact rephrasing like the previous one, but it's, it's pretty close. Um, so one can say that um, 
uh, instead of looking at uh, forming huge black hole from the particles that we throw in and then forming a, a completely stable state uh, by letting the black hole shed its mass, you could just start from the, from the bottom and just take one of these uh, charged particles and put it next to a copy of itself. And the um, uh, only force that will be acting on them is gravity in this case. Um, and then the particle will attract to its copy and they will form a bound state. And the, this bound state will be actually completely stable, just like the remnants, because the charge of the bound state will be twice the charge of the particle, but the mass of the bound state will be a little bit less than twice the mass of the particle because um, there is a binding energy. Um, and uh, it's easy to show that if you have some object and you want it to decay to something, then the object that it decays to must have a smaller mass to charge ratio than the original object. And since the bound state has a smaller mass to charge ratio than the particle, it cannot decay back to the particle just by charge and energy conservation. So it's completely stable in this sense. If you have many particles in your theory, some other particles, then you just have to do this with the particle which has the smallest mass to charge ratio in the theory, and then it cannot decay to anything else um, in the theory. So this way you can form this bound state. And of course, now you can take uh, two copies of this, uh, three copies of the particle, four copies and so on as you wish, and you will form a bound state of increasing uh, charges and they are all completely stable. Of course, if you take enough of these particles, you'll eventually form a black hole. And then you just go back to the arguments we discussed in the previous slides. But you can also see this uh, infinite number of completely stable bound states um, in the presence when you have a U on global symmetry just from the from the bottom up in this sense. And this will be a kind of more useful way to think about it for us. So just one second. Excuse me. Uh, so um, now we can uh, have, so we don't like this global symmetry U1, so we can gauge it. And of course, gauge U1 symmetries are perfectly fine in quantum gravity, um, but, um, uh, when we gauge it, then the story changes. And now we see why they are okay, uh, because now when we gauge the U1, if you put the particle next to its copy, they'll feel an attractive force due to gravity and also a repulsive force um, because of the U1 uh, gauge symmetry. And um, similarly for the black holes, now the black hole cannot just shed its mass down to the Planck scale, but there is an extremality bound. It will shed its mass down to its charge and Planck units, then it will stop. Once it's extreme, it will stop shedding any mass. So we see that we kind of stop this infinite number of uh, states, but we recover the same physics we had before if we send a gauge coupling of the U1 to zero. So if we send a gauge coupling of U1 to zero, we just go back to what we were before, uh, what we had before. And that's just a statement that if you take a U1 gauge symmetry and you send this gauge coupling to zero, you essentially turn it into a global symmetry because you're decoupling the propagating degree of freedom, but you're keeping the exact selection rule. So it's not enough to gauge the U1, but we have to gauge it strongly enough. Okay, so what does strongly enough mean? Strongly enough compared to what? Well, there's only other, one other player in this game, that's gravity. So strongly enough compared to gravity. Um, that's what we must do. And um, what do we mean more precisely by that? What is kind of clear from the picture, what we should do is just gauge it strongly enough so that the repulsive force beats the attractive force and you no longer form these stable bound states. So that's the most natural statement you can make. And of course, that's precisely the same condition as the statement that um, if you have a particle which doesn't form this bound state, then that particle will also allow black holes to discharge themselves and decay. So they will not be stable, so extremely black holes. So if you gauge a U1 strongly enough, stronger than gravity, then you, you solve all these problems. So that's, that's the motivation. And this is essentially what the weak gravity conjecture proposes, um, that you should, you, should, you should gauge a U1, not just, uh, you, should, you should have to, if you have a U1, gauge U1, it must be gauged strongly enough to avoid these stable black holes or stable bound states. Now, of course, it's not completely clear that should be true. I kind of gave a, a motivation for it in these slides, um, but that's why it's a conjecture and it's yet unproven. But if we assume that that's true, then we must have a charged particle in the theory whose mass is less than its charge. And black units so that uh, if you want if you take two copies of them the repulsive uh, gauge force will beat the attractive gravitational force um, so that's the that's what the weak gravity conjecture says and that's the motivation for it um, of course uh, uh, perhaps the strongest motivation for it is not these arguments but the fact that this seems to be true in string theory in all the 
uh, as I discussed in the first slide, and all the effective theories that we know of, this seems to be, 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 be holding. So the, the two kind of arguments seem, so, so the arguments and the string theory evidence seem to match well in that sense. Are there any questions about this? The, this is the kind of introduction to the weak gravity conjecture. Okay, so. Right. Aaron, can I, can I ask you a question? Can you hear me? Uh -huh. Yes. So, so, so there was a claim recently by Uguri uh, about the proof of the weak gravity conjecture. Do you have any comments on that? Uh, I have no comments. I did not read the, the paper. Although I think uh, yesterday they retracted that claim. Uh, oh, okay. I think they put out a new version, but I don't, I, I have not looked into details. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Okay. So, um, is there uh, more questions? Hello? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Finger. Is there some um, something special that happens when this uh, inequality is saturated? Like, are they, you know? Um, right. So, well, the the inequality is, is saturated in the presence of supersymmetry. Um, so, for example, like a BPS state, if you have extended supersymmetry, a BPS state will saturate it. Um, I, I, I'll explain that a bit later, but at least in the, in the absence of any massive scalar fields. So the, the, you could you could in fact turn it around and say the inequality can only be saturated if you have extended supersymmetry and you're looking at a BPS state. And I think that's that's actually a conjecture. And I think it's probably uh, if if the weak gravity conjecture is true, then this this is also true that it can only be saturated with supersymmetry. Because if you look at the inequality, then you see on the left hand side you have charge, which is an internal symmetry uh, object. Uh, and on the right hand side, you have mass, which is a Poincare symmetry uh, um, quantity. And if you want this to be saturated exactly, including all loop corrections and everything else, then you need some symmetry relating the two. And there's only one symmetry that can relate external and internal charges by the common Mandula theorem, that's supersymmetry. So, yeah, so I think the, it's, it's naturally the idea that if, if, it, if this thing is saturated, then you must have supersymmetry. It, it, is that actually your question, uh, so, or I don't know? If, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. So, 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 can I can I understand um, this answer? Is saying that if there are states which saturated, somehow those states are protected in some sense. You know, like you are you're saying uh, supersymmetry. Yeah. So exactly in the sense of saturated exactly as an exact statement, so at all loop order and things like this, then those would have to be BPS states. I think that's 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 a conjecture, and I think that's probably correct. Yeah. And, and and if you have uh, you know like uh, if I take many particles which saturate this you know like they should all form some threshold bound states and so on is that I mean like yeah so the BPS yeah you can take like uh, you know B, the, you can have a, many BPS states and they would be mutually uh, BPS and if they're just under the same U one and that basically means that they are they are like a bound state at, at threshold in the sense that. There is no force acting on 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 between them because the, the repulsive and the attractive force cancel exactly. Uh, okay. Okay. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the question. Are there any more questions? Uh, okay. So we'll carry on. Um, so now you can take this logic and you can um, try to extend it to more situations than than than, than the case of just a, a u one and gravity. And, and see where that takes us. So I think the most the first thing we might consider is well, okay, what happens if there's additional forces acting on these particles? So there's only one other kind of field that can mediate a, a self force between the particle and itself, and that's a scalar field. So if you have additional scalar fields in the theory, um, in particular massless scalar fields in the theory, because you want this to be a long range Coulomb like force, just like the gauge field in gravity. So if you have additional massless scalar fields in the theory, then you have an additional attractive force acting on these particles. And then the natural statement is that we should change the statement of the weak gravity conjecture, and we should reformulate it as a statement saying that now the gauge force has to beat both the attractive force of gravity plus the attractive force of the scalars to avoid these, these bound states. So one, one, one should change the weak gravity conjecture then in this way. So uh, note that they're adding quadrature, so, so you have to take the, the, the quadratic of it, and then you add this additional scalar interaction. So that's the proposal for the weak gravity conjecture independence of mass of scalar fields. And then um, uh, the logic, uh, just following the same logic. And then again, you can go and test this in string theory. So let me give some examples. And, and, and indeed, this seems to be the case in string theory. So this is from some nice work. Um, 
uh, by, by the CERN group and uh, were the CERN group at the time. And uh, you see here, the this is a spectrum of a particle in some F theory construction and string theory, the dots, and then the, 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 the red line, the red dashed line is the mass and the Y axis is the charge. So these particles, all these particles have a mass bigger than their charge because they lie above the line. But then you can also add the scalar interaction attraction, and then you get the blue line, which is then the sum of the total attraction. And then the red dots are those which lie above it. So those are things which are self-repulsive. So those are particles where the repulsion will beat the attraction. And you see um, that they are indeed present in the theory. Um, and there's uh, two other properties that we can note from this diagram. One is that there's not just one such particle, but many such particles. In fact, there's uh, conjectured to be an infinite number of such particles in, 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 uh, in quantum gravity. And secondly, they, they start from some charge of order one. So there is a particle of charge one that's self-repulsive, no particle of charge two that's self-repulsive, but there is a particle of charge three that's self-repulsive and so on. So they start with some charge of order one. So the general statement, and this seems to be true in, in all known string compactifications, is that there is always a self-repulsive particle with some charge of order one, and it's usually uh, uh, part of an infinite tower of such self-repulsive particles. That seems to be the pattern coming from string theory, and it matches very nicely the discussion we just had. Um, about the general arguments for, for why such a particle should exist. So no validation is found to date, but it's very important to emphasize that um, it's actually very difficult to test this in non-supersymmetric settings because it's just difficult to, to, to control non-supersymmetric vacuum and string theory. And so um, uh, there is, of course, this, or maybe we're being misled that there is some supersymmetry uh, uh, around. Um, note that these particles here are not BPS. These are non-BPS particles. That's why they're not lying precisely on the line. A BPS particles will lie precisely on the line. So in that sense, there is some no supersymmetry here, um, but the overall uh, compactification still has supersymmetry. So this is still an open question whether to, how to really test without supersymmetry the weak gravity conjecture and spring theory. But in all test time so far, this seems to be true. Are there any questions? Uh, okay, so let's carry on. So now we want to think, uh, so that's one modification of the gravitation. Now we want to think about a different modification. Let's think about what happens if we're in anti city space. So what should the weak gravity conjecture be in anti city space rather than flat space? Well, we just had a discussion about the, you take a particle and you ask if it's repulsive or attractive, but we just looked in that case at the uh, long range Coulomb forces. So like um, gravity, gauge field and massive scalar fields. And why, why can we do that? Well, because in flat space, we can take the particle and we can take it at an infinite separation from its copy. And at infinite distance, the only forces acting on a particle are the long range Coulomb forces. Okay, they're the only things that, that everything else drops off much faster. Um, so that the, the, the ones associated to massless fields. Um, but if you're thinking now in ADS, you can't do that anymore because ADS essentially acts like a box. So you can only separate the particle when we copy it up to the boundary of ADS. You can put them on the boundary of ADS space or, or something like that. So, um, and now it's actually, that means that you cannot really separate the long range Coulomb forces from all kinds of other interactions that you have that contribute to, 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 to this uh, particle in this copy and to the possible formation of a bound state. And so one should reformulate the conjecture. Um, I think that's the most, nat most natural statement to do, um, essentially to address completely, uh, to address directly the existence of these stable bound states. So we just want to forbid them. So we propose that weak graphic conjecture should be formulated, uh, especially in ADS space, but also in flat space. But in flat space, it just reduces to the previous ones I discussed. Um, as the positive binding conjecture that for any weakly coupled gravitational theory with a U1 gauge field, there should exist at least one charged particle in the theory with a charge of order one, which has a non-negative self-binding energy. That just means that it costs you energy to, to push it uh, closer to its copy. Um, or if you want to make it more precise, the difference between the lowest energy two particle state and twice the energy of the one particle state um, should be positive. Um, and uh, in flat space, this is basically, if you take the particle at infinite distance from each other, that's the same as what we just said, that's the repulsive force um, statement. But in ADS space, you can't do that. So let's look more precisely at why there's a modification in ADS space. So uh, in particular, we'll see, we'll see that not only the, the long range force is important, but also contact terms are important for this binding energy. So let's look at five dimensional ADS space and we follow the calculation done in this uh, paper. So 
this is a, a, a foundation of space. We have a gauge field, a gauge force. We have gravity, and we have this charged particle. We have no massless scalars here, so just this charged particle make, to make it simple. And there were these contact terms, go like phi to the four, um, that are going to be important now that were not important for the long range forces. So the binding energy is then calculated at tree level, it was done in this paper. Um, and um, what they find is that the binding energy receives three types of contributions, as you would expect, from the photon, from the graviton, and from quartic interactions. So photon exchange, graviton exchange, and from the direct quartic interactions. So the quartic interactions, of course, are non-zero because there is a non-trivial wave function overlap, and that's because the particle cannot be infinitely separated from its copy anymore. And this is the, ex the exact expressions they find for these contributions to the binding energy. And uh, in general, there's no um, hierarchical separation from these three different contributions. Um, uh, I rewrote here the math in terms of this uh, delta. Um, this uh, will lead naturally to, 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 to the next uh, statement, um, but essentially you can just replace delta by the mass. So, so the positive binding conjecture then makes the statement that uh, in, in theories of quantum gravity, you should find that this binding energy should be positive. So you see, it's not just a statement about the photon and the graviton, but it's now a statement including various quartic interactions and things like that. So it's, it's a different statement to, to the previous formulations, but it's really, I think, the, the rather natural one because that's the one that's saturated by supersymmetry. So if you have BPS states, then the binding energy is exactly zero, but it's not true that the photon and graviton interactions exactly cancel. Are there any questions? Sorry, what are little a and little b in this uh, last term? Yeah, so they are they are free parameters in the sense of they are these quartic coefficients. Can ah, okay, you see? Thank you. Yes, I, thank you. Yes, thank you. Yeah. So they are free. Uh, if we just write an arbitrary effective theory, you can do the, the full calculation. Um, if it's a supersymmetric theory, then they're fixed, and they're fixed to be some order one numbers. Uh, and, and, and and a and b can have uh, either sign. They are not positive. Yeah. Right? So so they can have uh, either sign. Uh, indeed, also supersymmetry doesn't fix. E it fixes the sum of them. I think. Um, uh -huh. But uh, they can have either sign. Uh -huh. Yes. I mean, you know, the statement is not that the binding energy associated to quartic interaction, quartic interaction, needs to be positive or negative. It can be either. But just that the sum of the whole things must be positive. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any more yeah, questions? Um, just a question. Uh, um, so you c included two particular terms, the A and the B terms in your effective action. Uh, why just truncate to, I mean, if you're including higher derivative terms, uh, why just the one with the B coefficient, why not others? Yes, yeah, so, so these quartic, sorry, the quartic terms are the only things that contribute to the binding energy. So right. you, with if you had like higher derivatives, um, yeah, so at two derivative levels, that's true. Um, oh, you could okay. consider like Delphi to the four or something like this. So I don't, yeah, I don't know. Maybe uh, uh, they, they would also do it, yeah. So this is a two derivative, two -derivative calculation. Yeah, so, okay. so you are right that there could be other contributions. OK, and uh, they would be not parametrically suppressed. Uh, uh. Um, yeah, it, well, it depends. Uh, yeah, this I don't know. Um, I mean, they'll be suppressed by the ADS radius, but I guess it depends. Uh, it, it depends. On, okay, so maybe I'll explain something here. Uh, the the quartic terms. If, if you take a supersymmetric theory, for example, then you can fix this a and b coefficients, and there's something in order one, and then you can show that the quartic term uh, goes to zero relative to the photon and graviton exchanges if you send delta to infinity. So if you take the mass very very large, and we can just understand that because if you take the mass large, the wave function is localized. And it doesn't sense the fact that it's an ADS space. Um, or if you want the wave function overlap, which is needed for the quartic term, goes to zero. So then you just get long range forces. So the quartic terms are important if you consider uh, fields whose mass is comparable to the ADS uh, radius. Right. And this would also be true of the high derivative terms. Uh, in that sense. They could also be important there. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. But of course, the, 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 this is just a particular contribution to the binding energy. The binding energy is something that's well-defined completely. It's just calculating it is sometimes hard. So uh, of course, there's, if there's additional scalar fields, they will also contribute to it. If there's other kind of states, you, they also contribute to it. So this is just uh, the calculation of it in a particular theory, just to show that it's very different to the previous formulations. But you are right that in general, there are many contributions to binding energy. This is just illustrative. Yeah. yeah. This is an illustrated calculation. Yeah. Of course, this theory is not something you get from string theory either. So, but yeah. Okay, 
Now, the nice thing is that if you're in ADS space, then we, we have a CFT dual, and then we can try to ask, well, okay, so that's a, a different formulation of the weak average conjecture. What does this correspond to in the CFT dual? And this is what's nice, that the binding energy has a very nice interpretation in the CFT dual, so much nicer than the other formulations. Um, it's simply the statement that the anomalous dimension of the operator phi squared so the operator, so phi is a field and it's dual, has an operator dual, which we'll also call phi. And the dimension of the operator phi squared should be bigger than, than should have, the anomalous dimension should be positive. This is not the anomalous dimension in the sense of the full dimension take away the classical one, but the dimension of phi squared minus twice the dimension of phi should be positive. And that's obvious because it's absolutely obvious because the, the dimension of, of phi squared is basically the, the energy of the state associated to phi squared and the dimension of phi is the energy of the state associated to phi. So you just ask that the uh, two particle state should be bigger, should have, should have a bigger energy than twice the energy of the one particle state. That's basically saying the binding energy should be positive. That's the same statement. Um, if you want to make precise, phi, what do we mean by phi squared here? That's the first leading operator in the operator product expansion of phi times phi. So that's the CFT dual to the statement, and that's a very nice, clean formulation of the CFT dual to, the, to this formulation of the weak arbitrary conjecture. And we can even write it more generally by not writing it in terms of a function of the operator, but a function of the charge um, of the operator. So the, the U1, there's a U1 gauge symmetry in the bulk that turns into a U1 global symmetry in the CFT. And the charge uh, of the operator of the field phi under the U1 gauge symmetry was Q. So the charge of the operator dual to phi under the U1 global symmetry would be Q. So then this is just a statement that the um, dimension of the operator of charge 2Q minus twice the dimension of the operator of charge Q should be bigger than zero. So that's the CFT formulation of the weak gravity conjecture, we just, the formulation of the weak gravity conjecture we just proposed. So it could positive binding conjecture. And this is a very simple uh, statement, um, uh, and uh, in fact, uh, uh, and so it's it's rather natural to 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 propose that to to it's very easy to formulate it completely uh, generally. Um, um, so uh, this is what we call the abelian convex charge conjecture. Now I'll state it as a statement for any CFT, although so far it's just we talked about CFT duals to some weakly curved backgrounds where we can talk about the weak gravity conjecture and this bound states and so on. And I'll justify it a little bit why we think it may be true in any CFT in a couple of slides. So let me just state it. It's called the abelian convex charge conjecture. So consider any CFT with a U1 global symmetry, denote by delta Q the dimension of the lowest dimension operator of charge Q. Then this must satisfy a convex like constraint that if you take um, uh, the dimension of the, uh, the lowest the dimension of the lowest dimension operator of charge N1 Q0 plus N2 Q0. This should be bigger than the dimension of the charge N1 Q0 plus uh, N2 Q0. So in the previous slide, Q0 was what we call Q and N1 and N2 would just be one, but you can of course do it with any number of kind of bound states. So um, we can take N1 and N2 to be any positive integers. And we insist that Q0 should be order one. Um, so uh, that's like the analog of the fact that the weak gravitational particles have charges of order one. So this is actually important. Uh, is there any question about this formulation first? Um, as, as a natural generalization of what we just what I just showed in the previous slide. Okay, so this this Q0 is important. So um, what is this Q0? Well, from the kind of bound state intuition we just had, then we expect it to be the operator with the smallest dimension to charge ratio in the theory. That's what I just said before. If you have many particles, you should look at the one with the smallest mass to dimension ratio. So again, now we should take the operator with small dimension charge ratio in the theory. And it's, it's, it's clear that if we define it that way, then the conjecture falls almost trivially because then the dimension of NQ0 uh, divided by NQ0 must be bigger than the dimension of Q0 divided by Q0 because that's by definition, the operator with the lowest mass to dimension ratio in the theory. And therefore the arranging this, you just get a kind of uh, positivity again, uh, uh, constraint, um, uh, a convexity type constraint. Uh, that this is bigger than n times this. Um, so um, it's really the non-trivial aspect of the statement is that q0 is order one. Okay. If we don't, if we drop the fact that q0 should be order one, there's always some q0 which will sat, which will have this kind of convex-like behavior. The the, this, the fact that q0 is order one is the non-trivial aspect to it, and this is really capturing the weak gravity conjecture. If we go back to our intuition from bound states, if this particle could form bound states, 
okay then um each time it forms a band state you will decrease the, the mass to charge ratio so that means that the operator dual the state which has a very small mass to charge ratio would be one where there's lots of these particles forming about state so it'll be a state with a very large charge okay the fact that the state with a small mass to charge ratio is a uh, uh, an order one charge that just means that you're taking this particle and it can't form the bound state okay if it could then you, you would keep decreasing its mass to charge ratio so this is really capturing the weak gravity conjecture okay are there any questions about this um, sorry um uh, again uh, stupid question i guess but uh, uh, why don't you say q0 is the smallest charge uh, okay so we'll, we'll give a counter example to that um I see. but I will give uh, some formulations and a talk of a stronger version of the conjecture, which um, was, we know is consistent with everything we know so far. So Q0 could be the smallest charge of the scalar operator in the theory. So the smallest scalar, uh, uh, the small, the charge of the, the smallest charge scalar operator in the theory, that could be true. Or it could also be the charge of the lighter, so the smallest dimension operator in the theory. So those two things are consistent with everything we know. And they could be true, and they are strong versions of the conjecture. And it's actually completely analogous strong versions of the weak gravity conjecture on the gravity side that people also studied. Okay. For the moment, we're just saying the Q0 of order one. Q0, to make that a sharp statement, if you want, you could say that it doesn't scale with any parameters of the CFT. Okay, so if you have some CFT with some parameters, then uh, Q0 doesn't scale with any of them. Um, so it cannot be made parametrically large by any parameters of the CFT. So that's the sharp statement, if you want. Um, okay. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, so now we make this wild leap, according to, 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 to the words of my collaborator, and say that, well, since the form, we've motivated this from weak gravity conjecture, which has some gravitational, weakly coupled gravitational um, uh, origin. Um, but the way we formulated it is just a statement about dimensions and charges of operators. And uh, this doesn't seem to be uh, required existence of a weakly curved gravitational dual at all. And so we uh, propose that, in fact, um, this conjecture holds for any CFTs, even those which don't have weakly curved gravitational duals. Now, you could say that any CFT defines a quantum theory of gravity, um, uh, because, uh, well, that's by, that's by definition, that's what ADS CFT proposes. Um, at least any CFT with energy momentum tensor defines a quantum theory of gravity. But typically, those quantum theories would not be those weakly curved Einstein gravity. There would be some other kind of gravitational theory. Um, maybe with many higher spin states or something like that. So uh, we propose that it's true for any quantum theory of gravity in that sense. Um, you, you could say that. That's what I'm saying that is true for any CFT. And there's some motivations for this. Um, first of all, there's no sharp distinction between weakly curved and strongly curved gravitational CFTs with weakly curved and strongly curved gravitational duals. So if something would really hold for any weakly curved CFT, you would expect it to hold for strongly curved CFTs. At least you can naturally um, um, uh, guess so. Um, another nice thing is that the formulation has no problem handling gravity duals, which have an infinite number of massless high spin fields. So those are the type of gravitational theories we expect to be dual to weakly coupled CFTs. Um, uh, it makes no reference to gravitons or gauge fields or things like that. So for example, the formulation saying the gravitational force should be strong, weaker than the gauge force, that would be a rather strange formulation to hold in any, uh, also in a strongly curved quantum gravity regime, because uh, in those theories, we have an infinite tower of uh, massless high spin field. And there's no particular reason to compare the strength of the spin one force with the spin two force. Why not compare spin three and spin four and so on? Um, on the other hand, the binding energy is a statement that can be applied in any kind of theory. Um, so this, at least, at least the formulation seems robust enough to be able to handle going to, to strongly curved regimes. So that's also another positive. Uh, evidence for it. And um, there's also another argument, which is that if the weak gravitation was really an exact statement, so an exact inequality, you would expect it to also be respected once you start including higher curvature corrections. And then if you continuously increase the higher curvature corrections, if this is really an exact statement, um, just in the same way that you can argue BPS states are protected against continuous variations of parameters, you might naturally expect that if there is an exact statement, it should be protected against continuous increase in curvature and show, should hold on to strong curvature regimes. So these are just rough kind of hand wavy uh, motivations, but of course, it's just, uh, as, as, as you say, a wild leap, a conjecture that this is true for every CFT. And the nice thing is we can just go and test it and, and see if it's true or not in, in what we know. So um, that's what we're going to do. So are there any questions about this? Uh, 
Okay, so this is what we propose that this, this uh, uh, convexity of the spectrum, the convexity, the abelian convex charge conjecture is true for any CFT. And we motivate it from weak architecture, but now we've made this extra step. Uh, before testing it, we can formulate a more general version of it. So let's say you don't just have one U1 symmetry. And this is the full uh, convex charge conjecture. So let me just state it. Um, the details are not really so important, but I'll state it. Um, the U1 case is kind of gives you enough intuition. So consider any CFT with a continuous global symmetry group G. Consider a simple factor G0 and G. And denote by delta R the dimension um, of the lowest dimension operator in the representation R of G. Then there is always some representation R0. So R0 is like the analog of Q0 in the case of U1. Okay, so now we have some representation R0. And it's non-trivial on G0, and it has weights of order one. So weights of order one, that's the same statement as saying that Q0 is order one. Such that the dimensions of the operator uh, um, delta uh, tilde Q, um, which is now the dimension of the operator, which is the Q symmetric product of this representation Q0. So I probably shouldn't have called it Q here. We should call it N. So little Q is like the N before. So like we had Q0, and then we had N times Q0. Here, instead of, we can't just do n times the representation R0, we take the nth symmetric product of it. Um, and now this, this dimension should be uh, convex. So it should satisfy this, the fact that delta of n1 plus n2 is bigger than delta of n1 plus delta n2. So this is really a very, just a natural generalization of the, of the previous statement to the case of non-abelian groups. Are there any questions about this case? Um, Okay, so this is the conjecture. This is the conjecture we made. It's motivated and inspired by the weak gravity conjecture, but it, it can be tested and holds by itself in CFTs uh, in general. So now, what we want to do is go uh, ahead and hello? yes, yeah. yeah. Uh, so I wanted to, you know, like um, ask uh, probably a somewhat big question. Um, let us say if I had a generating function for you know like these things, you know, like let's say I have a grand canonical. Uh, partition function or something uh, for these charge states. Um, this, uh, the kind of conjectures that you're saying about convexity and so on, uh, is it something, is, can it be framed in terms of some analytic property of that such a generating function? Um, like, I was trying um, to... Uh, well, it has a, it can be, it can be stated as, as a statement, it's a statement about the operator product expansion of the operators that the operator product expansion should be, uh, the leading term should be non-singular. Um, I, don't, I don't know if it can be stated as some statement in the partition function or, or something like this, or some ensemble of these things. Uh, maybe there is, I don't know. The statements yeah. that you're, the statement that you're making is really about the spectrum, right? I mean, uh, I understand that there is some operator product expansion kind of thing, but, but really it's really about two point functions, right? For example, the equation that you have in the slide, if I just know the spectrum, I don't need to know the OPE coefficients to check. No, yeah, it's just a spectrum for sure. Yeah. So, yeah. so, so, so in, in the generating function, um, like partition function contains uh, full information about the spectrum, right? It right. Doesn't, so, yes. But uh, I don't know what it corresponds, what the convexity corresponds to in the partition function. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Maybe it maybe it has a nice interpretation in the partition function, but I don't know it. That that would be interesting to think about. Yeah. Any more questions? Oh. Um, okay. So uh, let's go on to uh, test. So, so, so this is so we motivated and formulated a conjecture. Now we can go and uh, test it. Um, and uh, so let's talk about some general properties of CFDs and see if it can make sense in terms of what we know generally about CFDs. So one thing we know is that at large charge, the spectrum is convex. So uh, if the CFT is sufficiently generic. So this is to do with this so-called large charge expansion of CFTs. And uh, it's a very nice work uh, over the past few years, which argued that if you have a sufficiently generic CFT, and you look at the large charge uh, spectrum of it, then that spectrum, the dimension of the large charge operators behaves like this, um, like Q to the D over D minus one with some positive coefficient in front where D is a dimension. And that's, you see this is bigger than one. And that means that the spectrum is convex. Um, 
because uh, this is bigger than one. Um, essentially, the second derivative is positive. And the, this means that if Q0 was, was sufficiently large, then um, we, uh, uh, we expect the spectrum to be convex and the conjecture to be true. Okay, but of course we want to insist Q0 should be order one. So that's a non-trivial statement, but if we're light about it, larger should be true. Um, this also means something else. Um, we know that if we have a theory which has no big parameters or no small parameters, so let's say we, we take a completely strongly coupled theory, okay, where all the parameters are just one or order one, then we expect this large charge behavior, assuming it's sufficiently generic, to kick in at some order one charge. Okay, so by large charge, what people mean is that it's large compared to every other parameter in the theory. But if there are no large parameters in the theory, then it's just some order one number where large charge kicks in. And since uh, that means that the convexity will kick in at some Q, Q of order one, and that's precisely the conjecture. So in any sufficiently generic, strongly coupled CFT, we expect the spectrum to be convex. So that's, that's, that's a good sign already, assuming this large charge behavior. If it's not generic, let's say supersymmetric theories, then you can have things like BPS states of, let's say, if you take a free scalar field, then the spectrum becomes linear in the charge. So that's the spectrum of things like BPS states. And that's also convex. It's just it's marginally convex. OK, so, um, B, so BPS states and supersymmetric theories will also have a convex um, spectrum. Of course, if you have something like a BPS state and then you think about the higher charge states are not BPS, then they will all, they, the BPS bound will essentially ensure convexity in that sense, because that means that if, you, if the charge Q state is BPS, but charge 2Q state is not BPS, then that means that the mass of the charge 2Q state must be bigger than twice the charge of the mass Q state, because that's what the BPS bound says. The BPS bound says that the mass of the state must be bigger than, the BPS mass is the smallest it can get. So um, if, B, if, if, charge Q, if charge one state is BPS, then the charge two state, if it was BPS, it would have twice its mass. But if it's not BPS, it must have more than twice its mass. So it will always be convex um, in that sense. So this, so the convexity works well with supersymmetry. Uh, in two-dimensional CFTs, one can actually make a rather stronger, stronger statement. Um, in CFTs, you have left and right moving sectors. So you can look at one of them, let's say the left moving sectors. And then one can um, show that the dimension of the operative charge Q is given by AQ squared, where it's some positive coefficient, so it's convex, plus some contribution from uh, a dimension of an operator in the same CFT where you gauge the U1, so like the coset CFT. And uh, typically, you can choose the unitary of the identity operator in this gauge CFT, so it doesn't contribute to the charge, and then it just goes like AQ squared, which is convex. Um, I, I don't know when you can or can't do it, uh, but typically you can, but we can't prove that you can always choose identity operator here, otherwise it would be a proof in two dimensions. But generally you can, so um, in 2D CFTs it looks like um, one can even maybe try to prove it. Um, what other kind of theories we can think about that are simple? Well, we can think about free fermionic theories. So in the case of free scalars, the, the spectrum is marginally convex, but if it's a free fermion, the spectrum is not even marginally convex. At least if you take Q0 to be equal to the number of components of the fermions, which is some order one number. And this is because of Pauli's exclusion principle. So if you take some fermionic field and you try to, it has some charge Q, let's say, and you try to make a, an operator which has a very large charge, then you keep putting in, uh, inserting this fermionic field, but um, because they are Grassmannian, you can't insert more than twice, you can't insert twice the same field. In other words, the, the most that you can insert is the number of components of that fermion. So if you want to make a higher charge object, you have to start putting in derivatives. So those operators have derivatives in them. And derivatives increase the dimension of the operator, but don't increase its charge. So they just make the spectrum more and more convex. Okay. So for example, if you look in three dimensions, we have the spectrum, which is, well, it's convex with respect to one and two. That's because there's two components of this fermion. So there's like one, two. But then if you look at the dimension, let's say, of operator of charge two, plus the dimension of operator of charge three, that's two plus four, that's you see not even marginal, marginally convex with respect to the operator of, of charge five, which has dimension eight. Okay, so it, it's non-convex by order one for fermionic theory, free fermionic theories. And what this tells us is that if we then take a free fermionic theory and you add any kind of interaction which is perturbative, so any deformation of the theory which is controlled by some small parameter, then convexity will be maintained. 
because it was an order one convexity and then you're doing some small deformation of theory, whatever that is, whether it be large N or weak coupling, you're not going to change the spectrum by order one. And so the spectrum will stay convex. So the only way out actually um, for fermionic theory is to, to have a non-convex, to possibly have a non-convex spectrum um, is if you have a large number of fermions. So the number of fermions is the only parameter which can possibly uh, test the conjecture. Because if you have a very large number of them, you don't have to insert derivatives when you form a large charge operator. And then you can try to uh, have be marginally convex uh, classically, at least. So that's the only test that we can have. Any theory with an uh, order one number of fermions, um, which has uh, uh, some perturbative expansion, will satisfy the conjecture. And if it doesn't have a perturbative expansion, if it's strongly coupled, then it will satisfy the conjecture by the large charge behavior argument I just gave you. I just gave in the previous slide that if it has no big parameters, um, then um, uh, you expect large charge behavior to kick in at charge of order one and therefore it's convex. So I think the fermionic theory is the only possible um, tests um, uh, that could be challenged to the conjecture are, are theories with a very large number of fermions. Okay, so now those are general arguments about general CFT. So it's, those general arguments seem, seem to, to be consistent with the conjecture. So before I move on to specific theories, are there any questions about the general things I just said? Um, okay. So um, now we can test them in, in actual explicit theories as well, um, specific theories. So specific theories to do calculation, you need them usually to be not strongly coupled. So you need some kind of weak coupling expansion. And then you have some um, way to identify the operator with the actual fields in the theory. And so essentially what we can be testing is something like taking the field to the power of n1 plus n2, and then comparing it to the dimension of the operator, which is field to the n1 and field to the n2. So we have this gamma parameter that's like the binding energy in the dual or the convexity parameter. And the convexity conjecture basically just says this should be positive um, or a semi-definite positive. So let's look at uh, specific sorry, theory. Uh, yes? Uh, if, I, if I may just uh, interrupt a bit. So, so you just um, argued you know, like a few minutes ago that the, the Pali uh, exhibition principle and Fermi Dirac statistics actually you know like uh, takes you makes makes the spectrum very very convex uh, right i mean but is the the theories, yeah. yeah 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 where the dirac uh, where, where the fermi dirac statistics is uh, is playing its role uh, or police expression but is the opposite true that you know like the bose einstein statistics uh, where where you know like you have a lot of bosons uh, the spectrum becomes close to being marginally convex or uh, you know. Yeah, I mean, the analog statement, so I talked about free fermionic theories, where it's, we, we, so the analog statement would be free scalar fields, free scalar theories are marginally convex, exactly. That's, that's what I just said. Uh, that's what we said. Now. So, okay, okay. Uh, free, um, fermionic, free scalar yeah. theory is basically a linear like this. So they are marginally convex. Right. right. Uh, so I, I understand that uh, you are uh, talking about CFT sense one, but uh, but what what about you know like if you have uh, a phase where there's a Bose Einstein condensation or something like that uh, uh, you know like are we uh, would you say that uh, something like this is true even in such a state uh, well it's not a yeah, state. I yeah, yeah, I don't know what I don't, I don't I don't know anything about theories that are not CFTs in the sense that I don't know what statement one could say I mean I think a natural statement is that if you take a CFT if you if you take a theory which can be you be completed to a CFT in some sense, or that is a margin that is a deformation of a CFT by some relevant operator or something like this, then perhaps it should still hold in some sense. I don't know. But we, we make no statements about things that are not CFTs. Um, but but of course, you know, if you have some phase transition, then you know phase transitions correspond to CFTs. So um, it, 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 we expect this uh, this to be true for things that correspond to have some kind of phase transition where there's some CFT describing uh, this phase transition. So, so in that statement, it's, it, it, it is some statement about general theories, but essentially it's a statement about CFTs. Um, okay. Uh, and uh, can I uh, ask one more question? So how, like, um, if you, but in theories where you have like some kind of Fermi Bose duality and so on, you know, like uh, uh, how does this uh, 
distinction work uh, about the spectrum being convex or not? Uh, uh, yes, yeah, so there, there would, I would imagine there would not be close to being free theories. So, I mean, you can you can do like you mean like things like where you exchange, you form like uh, mesonic operators from, from fermions and then have that dual to some scalar operators or something like this, or? Yeah, there are, I mean, there are, you know, three kinds of examples. One, one, can, one can consider the kind of thing that you just said. In, in yeah, so, so those, so and if uh, you form like a scalar operator, then you could treat that as a scalar. It's not really a, a, a fermion. Um, and you have to go to strong coupling. If it's weakly coupled, then you, the, the, it's like the free fermionic theory. You, if, you, if you try to take powers of this meson, then you just have to keep inserting also more fermions. But if it's a strongly coupled theory, then they, they would essentially behave like, uh, um, like, like, like uh, they could behave like scalars. So you can avoid it that way, or it can have a very large number of, of fermions. So if let's say it's a, it's a gauge theory and you take the gauge parameter very large in this theories to get this duality, then, then uh, this, this Fermi both statistics are not important. But apart from that, I don't have any, anything else to, to say about that, yeah. So, so in the 2D theories, you can, uh, 2D, you can, you can just uh, dualize the free theories. But there you're saying it will just how do, you know it will work. Uh, uh, uh. Yeah, I mean in the two D theories, the, there's this discussion, this argument I just gave earlier that we expect it to be convex. But okay, uh huh. Uh, uh, but but there it is not true that this uh, Fermi statistics makes it far from being convex. Is it? No, I mean there it's 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 more than just marginally convex because it goes like q squared. So okay. for, for either one, it's not like marginally convex. Um, yeah. Okay. 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 Yeah. In, in higher dimensions, the the scalar one is marginally convex. The other one is not. So it's, yeah. Any more questions? So I don't. Yeah. I just sorry, I, I, some of the questions I don't know the answer. I mean. All, the only statement we have is the ones that we made, um, but it's very interesting to think about how these statements, how convexity uh, uh, plays with dualities and things like that. I think that's an interesting direction to think about. Yeah. Any more questions? Okay, so um, let me go through the example uh, theories. Um, so the simplest thing we could think about is just the U1 theory. So this, we can think about something like Wilson Fisher fixed point in, in, in the CFT in four minus epsilon dimensions. So this is just a, the, this quartic scalar theory and in, in four minus epsilon dimension. So uh, this has a fixed point where the coupling is, is goes like epsilon, like in the, is the right here. It's not really a rigorous test of the conjecture because we really restrict to unitary theories where this theory is actually non-unitary. But um, we will see that convexity may not be precisely uh, controlled by unitarity, uh, but maybe by something else like the, the, the existence of a vacuum. So it's still important to to study these, um, and one can calculate the spectrum of the uh, charge n operator. This is actually done quite recently, and you find that this is positive indeed. So this gamma is positive, and therefore the spectrum is convex. So this is a perturbative calculation, so for small epsilon and small lambda, but in fact there's semi-classical methods which allow you to extend this to non-perturbative regimes, um, so to calculate the spectrum for any epsilon n, Okay, so, so this is only true if n is smaller than n epsilon is smaller than one. So you look at charges times the epsilon times the coupling, which is smaller than one. If it's bigger than one, you have to change your methodology, you go to a semi classical analysis, and you can still show the spectrum is convex. So you can prove that in this theory, the spectrum is convex at any charge, even um, at what you would call strong coupling in that sense. So that's, that's the first check. Um, it's true. We can do, one can do similar calculations in the ON quartic model in 4 minus epsilon dimension. Again, you find that the result is positive, so the spectrum is convex. One can look at the U1 and ON sextic models in 3 minus epsilon dimensions. And again, one finds that the spectrum is convex. Actually, in this case, the first contribution to the anomalous dimension comes at two loops. So then you have this interesting structure, which is like N1 percent to minus 2. So if you take n1 and n2 to be bigger than two, n1 plus n2 to be bigger than two, then it's convex. If it's n1 and n2 are equal to two, then this two loop contribution vanishes and you have to look at the next order, which is the four loop. But then you can show that this is indeed positive. So um, the spectrum is fully convex also in these models. Um, 
more recently, there was a paper that came out following up to our paper, which studied the UM times UN quartic model in four minus epsilon dimension. So it's something like this. And they have two kind of marginal parameter operators with these marginal operators, uh, coupling associated with marginal operators, U and V. And they calculated the spectrum. And indeed, they find that it's convex. Actually, if you take um, M and N to be uh, this R, if you take this R to be negative, you choose M and N such that this R is negative, then the, the theory is non-unitary and these couplings become complex. But they took, they calculated the dimension and they find that the real part of them of the dimensions of the operator is still convex. So even when you, you go to these kind of complex coupling values, which are non-unitary theory. So that's something interesting. I don't know what that means, but um, in general, this is again passive to conjecture. So that's a perturbative analysis of theories which don't actually have gauge symmetries. Um, another way you can analyze these theories is using large n expansion. And those are kind of stricter, better tests of the conjecture because then you can do them in integer dimensions and you can look at the unitary theory. So you can calculate the, the, the spectrum of the ON quartic model in three dimensions. And you find this result here. And this is that you see the quadratic coefficient is positive. That means that the spectrum is convex. So indeed, it passes the test there. Um, you can look at the ON quartic model in five dimensions and in six minus, uh, you can look at the ON cubic model in six minus epsilon dimension. And actually the two theories are, are conjectured to be related to each other. One is by UVIR duality. Um, and there you find that this coefficient is negative, which means that the spectrum is not convex. So you find that the conjecture is violated in those theories. But those theories are also known to be non-unitary. There are um, non-unitary effects that come in at uh, non-perturbative level n. So this is OK, because we only expect convexity to be true in unitary theories. Um, so in that sense, it's quite interesting. It's actually quite interesting because the, the conjecture is violated perturbatively in n, but the non-unitariness of these theories comes in at non-perturbatively at n. So the conjecture, if true, would be actually perturbative um, uh, first perturbative uh, is like kind of a hint that these theories should be non-unitary. So I think that's interesting. Um, okay, are there any questions about these theories so far? Uh, I don't know how much, I have only a few minutes left. I'll try, it's not much more to go. Another kind of thing you can look at. It's fine, you can take a bit more time if you need. Okay, well, I think 10 minutes no, should be fine, yeah. 10 minutes um, is good, yeah. Yeah, so another kind of theory you can look at are gauge theories. Um, so you can look at things like bank Zach's fixed points, so those are CFDs. So you can consider four-dimensional SUNC gauge theory with NF massless fermions and NC massless scalars. And this has a perturbative fixed point, so called bank Zach's fixed point. And uh, actually, because you have scalars, you also have these marginal operators in the theory, um, like phi to the four terms, and they have these coefficients in front of them, H and F. And when you find a fixed point of CFT, then you have to have not only a fixed point for the gauge coupling, but also for these, um, uh, these uh, lambda type couplings. So, um, and, uh, but such fixed points do exist, uh, it was, as it was shown in these papers. And then in those fixed points, you can look at um, uh, operators that are charged under this uh, SUNS global symmetry. So that's the global symmetry rotating the scalar fields. So if you have NS scalar fields, they have an SUNS global symmetry associated with them. And then you can form mesons from them because you have to look at gauge invariant operators. So it's now it's a gauge, a gauge theory. And you can look at the dimension of these mesons. So um, this is the meson. Uh, the, nth, uh, the, 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 the nth charge uh, meson is just this phi star to the power of n. Notice this is phi star phi, so not phi dagger phi, in the sense that you don't want to take the same flavor indices for the two phi's because then you get a flavor singlet. We want to look at operators that are charged under the flavor symmetry SUNS. So you have to take um, different flavor indices for the phi's. And then what you can calculate is the dimension is the difference in the dimension between the uh, two meson operator and twice the dimension of the one meson operator and um, at one loop. And uh, actually this calculation not been done. We did it in the paper. And one what finds is that it goes like some positive number times the sum of these quartic coefficients, H plus F. Um, there's something interesting about here because you see the 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 dimension difference uh, convexity doesn't depend on the gauge coupling, just on these quartic couplings, and that's because the the gauge the gluon contributions to the anomalous dimensions cancel when you take this difference. So that's interesting. Um, and then uh, this is uh, positive because um, this, you can show that the sum of these coefficients must be positive um, in any fixed points, and in fact it must be positive just because 
if there was more positive, if there were negative, you would not have a vacuum of the theory because the theory would just run away, it would just have a negative uh, 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 potential. So uh, 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 this must be positive to have a vacuum in the theory, and therefore the spectrum must be convex. And so we see a direct relation between the existence of a vacuum in the theory and the convexity of charged operators. And this is something you can see over and over again. Um, actually, you can see this already like in the simplest example, which is this 4 minus epsilon, let's say. Um, if you, you see that the convexity goes like epsilon, which is like the quarter coupling lambda, and if you take lambda to be negative, then this becomes negative and the spectrum becomes concave, not convex. But if you take it to be negative, you also lose the vacuum of the theory. So this is a pattern that we see over and over again, that uh, if you want a vacuum to the theory, then you, you have convexity, you need convexity, at least in the examples that we've calculated it. So again, this kind of bank Zach's fixed point is, 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 is passes the test, at least for scalar mesons. We didn't do the calculation for fermionic mesons, which are much more involved. Um, okay, so let's look at a completely different kind of test you can do also. You can look at strongly coupled gauge theories and calculate the dimension of charge operators using semi-classical methods. So for example, you can look at three-dimensional U and C gauge theory with NF fermions. This flows to a CFD in the IR. And this has a global symmetry you want topological, which is the global symmetry whose current is dual, Hodge dual to the field strength of the gauge field, as discussed by Polyakov and, and things like that. And the operators charged under this, you want topological global symmetry are the monopole operators. And you can calculate the dimension of these monopole operators using semi-classical methods. And you can show that at large NF, with large number of fermions, uh, the dimension of these uh, takes this form here. And then it, you can see that this is the leading contribution and you can check that this is indeed convex. So if you look at the dimension of charge one plus charge two, let's say it's less than the dimension of charge three. So this is a completely different setting, completely different calculation, but you find that again, the result is convex. And you can do similar things in three-dimensional gauge fields with scalars instead of fermions. And then with the scalars, you can have them with or without quartic terms. And then if you don't have the quartic, if you have the quartic terms, this is what's called the CPN model. If you don't have quartic terms, it's called the tricritical model and the computation of the monopole operators was done. Uh, in these papers, and you find that the spectrum is again convex, so it satisfies convexity um, according to the con uh, matches the conjecture. You can also look at fermionic theories with quartic couplings, so like gross nova type couplings, and then this is this uh, uh, the result that was done recently. And the 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 quartic so the the, the blue one is the uh, free the, the fermion uh, just the gauge in fermions without the quartic coupling, and that's convex. And you can also show that this spectrum is also convex. So again, you find convex results. Um, you can look at Chern-Simons theories. So you can take these gauge theories and add Chern-Simons terms with an arbitrary level K. And what one finds is that the spectrum remains convex and becomes monotonically more convex as you increase the Chern-Simons level. So Chern-Simons interactions only increase convexity of the spectrum monotonically. So that's uh, again, therefore, any Chen Simons uh, theories will satisfy convexity. These kind of Chen Simons theories will satisfy convexity. So, three dimensional Chen Simons theories. Um, what more can we do? Okay, so this is an example why you can't take Q0 to be the lowest charge. I don't know if I should skip it or I have like two more slides. We have a couple more minutes because this is a question that was asked why can't we take Q0 to be, order, to be one, to be the lowest charge? So, this is an example where you can't take it to be the lowest charge. So, you can take a look at a supersymmetric theory. And look at a single chiral field. So look at the phi cubed type of super potential. And in three dimensions, this flows to an infrared interacting fixed point. Also, in four, four dimensions, it just flows to a fixed point, but just a free fixed point. So three dimensions is a bit more interesting. And then, since it's supersymmetric theory, you have the global U1R symmetry. And because it's U1R symmetry, the charge and the dimension of the operators are related, um, because this is a BPS operator. So uh, if you look at the scalar component of the superfield, it has charge two thirds, um, and the dimension is equal to the charge in three dimensions, so it has a charge two thirds. But now let's normalize the charge to be integer, so we multiply the charge by three. So we would say that the dimension of the charge two operator is two thirds. But now, if you look at the fermionic component of the superfield, it has charge one third, or if you multiply by three, it has charge one. But the dimension of it is charge is seven six. That's because the dimension of uh, scalar plus two fermions should, should sum up to um, uh, sum up to three in three dimensions. So, um, and 
Therefore, we see that this would not be convex, the spectrum would not be convex if we took Q0 to be one, because twice the dimension of charge one is bigger than the dimension of charge two. Okay, so that's not possible. But if we take Q0 to be two, then the spectrum is convex because it's a BPS operator. So if you if you look at the two scalar operator um, at, at phi squared and phi cubed, then the, because of the BPS bound, then you will find that this, the mass of the 2n must be always bigger than n times the mass of two of the charge two operator. So this is an example where we can't take Q0 to always be the lowest charge. Um, but yeah. And then the last slide I have is about um, what happens in strongly coupled theories. And um, as, as I said, in strongly coupled theories, you always expect the spectrum to be convex for some charge of order one. And um, we will see that that's also true here. But what you can do is form stronger versions of the conjecture, which we proposed, and test those in strongly coupled theories. So strongly versions of the conjecture are the following. Q0 should be the charge of the lightest charged operator, so the smallest dimension operator. Or Q0 should be the smallest scalar operator charge. So if you look at a scalar operator, there should be the smaller charge of scalar operator. So those are two things that are consistent with everything we've seen so far, actually, all the examples so far. And we can test them in strongly coupled theory. So for example, if you look at the O2 model in three dimensions, and uh, this is the spectrum is calculated by various different methods, like five loop and epsilon or, 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 or lattice or bootstrap methods, and the spectrum is convex. And we see that it's convex from the smallest charge. So it satisfies these strong versions of the conjecture. So um, this seems to be um, also true. And this is actually just a comment. This is an interesting theory because it's actually the theory that's supposed to describe the superfluid transition of helium. It describes it very well. And then you can actually experimentally measure some of the anomalous dimensions, some of these, the most dimensions of some of these operators. At least the, the singlet operator has been experimentally measured. You can also kind of measure the charge operators by uh, deducing them from measurement of the couplings. Um, and uh, in that sense, it shows that this convexity, uh, since, uh, may, since many CFTs describe uh, physical systems that we can create in, in nature, uh, perhaps we can make um, um, connections between this convexity uh, and uh, experimental measurements. Even if we don't know what a CFT is, if convexity is truly a general property of every CFT, maybe there's a way to, to experimentally measure it in, in, um, in systems, uh, just like this helium transition, for example. So I think that's an interesting um, uh, thing, but I don't know exactly how to make it work, but maybe for the far future. So to summarize, we propose that the natural formulation of the weak gravity conjecture is in terms of the self-binding energy of a particle. This leads to a CFT dual statement, which is that the spectrum of charge operators should be convex. It seems to hold in all examples we tested so far. Um, in the absence of general argument of proof, we need to keep testing or searching for counterexamples, or of course, it would be nice to try and prove it. Um, um, and uh, there's this tantalizing possibility of making uh, connections to experiments which, which probe systems that are well described by some CFTs, like the O2D equals three model. Uh, that's it. Uh, thank you. Sorry for running over time a bit. Okay, thanks a lot, Evan, for the great talk. Um, so, are there any more questions for Evan? Oh, sorry. Yeah, uh, maybe I'll ask something related to what Loga was asking about the partition function. Uh, so in some way, uh, as uh, he was saying, it's in some sense a statement about the partition function. It's um, uh, something where you take the derivative with respect to the chemical potential uh, uh, and compare it with the derivative with respect to the temperature. Uh, uh, and uh, I was wondering whether there's some thermodynamic, at least in some regime, uh, a thermodynamic reason for this to happen, or sort of related to maybe your uh, observation in examples that when there's no vacuum, then this conjecture is uh, is violated, and so somehow it's somehow there's a thermo maybe a thermodynamic stability uh, sort of reason why uh, why this might hold at least in in some regime, uh, it's uh, sort of smells a little like some of the things you hear about 
uh, in thermodynamics you say compressibility is positive and so on uh, and that comes from taking derivatives with respect to the chemical potential and the sort of stability uh, leads to positivity conditions so i i, I just thought i would uh, but I think that sounds very interesting. I, don't, I mean, like I said, we don't know how to prove it. We don't know how to. Yeah. But I think so, what you say sounds very interesting and, 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 and plausible. Uh, actually, in the paper, we just said that we insisted on unitarity. Um, so not really vacuum stability, but uh, unity theory is with a stable vacuum. So we want to unity theory stable vacuum, but I think it seems to hold also in non-unitary theories which have a stable vacuum like in four minus epsilon dimensions and things like that, but seems right. to be fail in theories which don't have a stable vacuum. And which the correspondence is- to, Yeah, with the thermodynamic stability. Yeah, so exactly. So I think a thermodynamic kind of explanation would match very nicely with, with the evidence we have so far. Um, so I'll, I think that's very nice to try and think about something like that, yeah. I mean, of course, one uh, one thing is to think about what does the weak gravity te teach us about CFTs? So maybe it taught us this about CFTs. I don't know if the conjecture is true, but of course, uh, what, one thing that would be nice if one can prove it in the CFTs, since that's a very well-defined framework with axioms and so on, then you would also at least prove this version of the weak gravity conjecture in ADS, which I think would be um, also a very nice result. Yeah. So, so, so I think I think there's a lot of motivation to try and understand what this means from the CFT side. Yeah. Right. Any more question? Uh, maybe I'll ask one more then, um, uh, which is, I mean, you, it, it's perhaps a little related to your generalization, but maybe this is if you have sort of two U1s, uh, uh, and uh, uh, if you have two U1s, and of course, each individual U1, there is maybe a convexity, but uh, is there some sort of a joint convexity that you can have? Uh, um, which, uh, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Very good question. I mean, is, 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 the case of multiple U1s is really tricky because if you have multiple non abelian symmetries, then it's not really an issue. But multiple U1s, if you have two U1s, you can form an infinite number of U1s from them by just taking N1, N, N U11 plus M U12 and take any combination of them, you can form any an infinite number of U1 symmetries in your theory. In that sense, um, and then you could ask: Should it be convex in any direction along this this mm -hmm. GU one? So, um, so all I can say, I don't know. I mean, what we said was that we expect that if you have n u ones, then there are at least n linearly independent directions for which you would have convexity. But of course, you can ask: Should it be convex for any direction? Um, and this is something that's been thought about a lot on the gravity side. So what happens if you have two U1 gauge symmetries? And there the statement is this, that you should have a particle. The spectrum should be, it's not, it's not enough to have convexity or in the case of the weak gravity conjecture, it's not enough to have what's called extremality, super extremality of the particle along each U1 by itself. But you, what you need is the spectrum to be such that when you plot the charge to mass ratio of the particles in your theory and you join them up, along this two-dimensional U1 plane, um, the convex hull that you formed from this spectrum should include in it the whole spectrum of possible black holes, extremal black holes in the theory. So there's something called the convex hull condition. Um, and there should be some similar statement here, um, but we don't know, we haven't gotten into it. But the case of multiple U1s is, is what is the statement for multiple U1s is, is an open question, I think. Um, it's, yeah, it's an interesting, it's been thought about a lot on the gravity side, so there are various proposals, like there should be a lattice of particles that satisfy it and so on and so on, sometimes called the lattice weak gravity conjecture, but yeah, we didn't make, we have nothing new to say on that here. Um, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, I also had a small question. So, um, what about the, you know, the completeness conjecture? So, 
is there some statement on the CFT? Well, yeah, so we'll just say that for any uh, charge of the UN global symmetry, there is some operator which has that charge. But this um, is probably not true for every CFT, right? Is it? Um, I don't know any counter examples, but um, it's a very weak statement in some sense. It's much weaker than this, of course. Uh, okay. Because it doesn't say anything about what dimension of that operator needs to be, just some operator. So I would have thought that this, this should be true for any CFT quite easily. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. That that does that does sort of have a proof. Some people claim to prove that in oh. in reality, completeness. But because completeness is very closely related to global symmetries, because if you just take a pure U1 theory with no charge matter, then it actually has not only a gauge symmetry but a global symmetry. This is called one form global symmetry, generalized global mm -hmm. symmetry, and the way to break that is by introducing some charge matter that breaks it. So. Uh, so this is what completeness says, basically, that you, you have to break this one form global symmetries that you have for. Uh, so, I see. Okay. Okay. Yeah, and, and using that, using then if you can prove that there's no global symmetries in quantum gravity, then you essentially can prove completeness. So that that's the way that the, the the idea of a proof goes. I think in ADS it's been proven. I don't know if that's space, but I think generally we expect that to be true. So it should be true also for every CFT. I think. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Any more question? Okay, if not, let's all thank uh, Iran again for the very interesting talk. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, thanks a lot. So okay. let me end the meeting now. Bye. Okay, thank you again. Goodbye. Bye.